Good morning, Lead Dev London. What a treat to be back here today. I spoke to a number of people who had come here a couple of years ago, and it's really amazing to see people who've gone there on their own leadership journey. And for those of you who are here for the first time, I wish you all the best in learning for your own leadership journey. Let's start with a question. What did computers look like in 1950? I wasn't around then, and I'm sure many of you weren't around there either. But these computers were huge. They used to fill up a whole room. They used to be large, mechanical, loud beasts. And this example in the picture here is the Univac. And so this is actually one that would actually fill a garage. It would often break down. It would need a lot of maintenance. And it's interesting to sort of ask yourself, how did actually people program these sorts of machines? Very different from the tools and frameworks that we use today. Back then, you used to program these large machines with machine language, so hexadecimal code that looks like gibberish. Could you imagine writing programs and things like this today? Now, there was one programmer back at this time who decided there was going to be a better way of writing programs, something that we could do to be a lot more effective in how we actually build software. They actually suggested, instead of writing in low-level machine language, we might actually write in programming languages with English, in words. Other programmers quickly dismissed this. This can't be done. Machines can only understand arithmetic. They can't understand English. And this program was determined to show the world that this was indeed possible. In 1952, they produced a tool that managed to map symbols to mathematical terms. The result was a tool called the A compiler using the, program, the first programming language called the A0 programming language. And this tool is often tr attributed to popularizing the term compiler as we know it today. Productivity skyrocketed, and the programming community wanted more. In 1959, computer experts from industry and the government gathered at a two-day conference, the Conference on Data Systems Language. The programmer of the A compiler advised this group on how to take this idea further. The result? The birth of COBOL. Now, COBOL is sometimes referred to be the most ubiquitous business language today. And there are still some companies out there, <clears throat> older banks, that run systems in this language. An interesting question, though, is who was this programmer who showed this act of leadership? Some of you may know the story behind this. And this is indeed the famous programmer, Admiral Grace Hopper, a giant whose shoulders we stand upon today. Good morning, my name is Patrick Kwa. I'm the chief scientist at N26 and former CTO. And we're on a mission. Our mission is to build the first bank you'll love. And it's often two words you don't think of in the same sentence, banking and love. Unlike traditional banks, we want to bring beauty and simplicity to banking. And we offer the first uh, contactless metal card in Europe, uh, and this one is the black uh, charcoal gray card. But it's a great pleasure to be here at Lee Developer Conference again. Now, it's something that's very close to my heart. It's a personal mission of mine of helping people go on their personal journeys, becoming much more effective in the realm of being a tech lead. Now, some of you who've been in this room have been on the course, and there's 30 of you who'll be on, actually on one tomorrow. And I'm really grateful to be sharing some uh, experiences. I've trained more than hundreds of types of tech leads, and it's really gratifying to sort of see people go on their personal journey. I've also talked to lots of different tech leads and different people in different leadership roles at technical sort of field. And it's interesting to sort of see how everyone has a different style. And so we will look at different flavors of technical leadership as part of this. Now, for those of you who end up doing a course, we actually end up doing a self-assessment. And as part of this, you end up evaluating where you are and where you might want to be as a way of defining your own personal growth journey. And what's really fascinating is, as people fill out this shape, you end up with many different types of patterns. Now, having run this course many, many times with different people, you never end up with the same exact pattern for different people. And that's OK. As a programmer who likes patterns, who likes creating order, you end up appreciating these different shapes, and you won't be able to get them into the same shape, and that's OK. What we all have as individuals, as individual leaders and people, 
is we have unique flavors. Each of you here will define your own personal style, your own flavor of leadership. You'll take examples and inspiration from other people, but ultimately, you are you and yourself. And you need to be comfortable in the way that you lead and grow. Throughout this talk, we'll look at a few flavors of technical leadership from different perspectives. We'll look at the what, and what do we mean by technical leadership? We'll look at the where, and where do people typically demonstrate technical leadership? And finally, the how, or how do people demonstrate technical leadership in typical patterns? So let's start off with the what. Before we begin, let's talk about building a common language. And like in this quote here, we're really bad at naming things. People have titles like lead developer, tech lead, development manager, IT manager, engineering manager. Each company has their own definition. And even within the same company, you end up with many different variants and flavors. So this role can be very fuzzy. So let's build some shared vocabulary and make sure that we understand what I'm talking about when we talk about technical leadership today. Now, as I was doing research for this talk, I was generally surprised by how many variations there are for the term of leadership. I went to Oxford, Merriam-Webster, dictionary.com, and I found it super interesting at how broad we can use this term. So there's no wonder it's really confusing. Let's take a look at some examples. Kai is part of the platform group leadership. How is the term leadership being used here? Well, in this context, this is the leaders of group, are a group or people in a company or organization, so it's a role or a title. Now, it's an interesting definition, but not very useful or insightful for me for this one. Roles come and go, and as we've learned, we know that titles and names of roles are different across organizations and inconsistent. We're bad at naming. What about this example? Alex has really improved their leadership skills. Perhaps we can see how people have actually got a skill in this. And this is indeed the ability to learn. And I like this definition a lot better. An ability is a trait. If you follow the work of Carol Dweck and her work on mindset, with a growth mindset, an ability is a trait that you can actually grow. It's a trait that you can find training on, read about, practice, something that you can develop and something you can also teach and pass on to others. What about this example? Dana took leadership to agree on a strategy to improve our test automation. This is a very interesting use of the word leadership. And in this case, it's the act of leading a group of people. Now, I really like this. And this is really interesting because an act is an action, something that you, I, or anyone else in this room can actually do. You don't need a title, you don't need a role, you don't need permission. You don't even need a deep skill in leading or be recognized as somebody with deep skill in leading. You don't need permission. It's broad and inclusive. All it takes is a single step, a single action of doing something and taking people with you. And what this means is anyone can be a leader. All it takes is this simple action. And this is something that I find myself repeating to people who are looking to be leaders. You don't need to wait to have the title. You don't need to worry about if you've built enough leadership skills. All you need to have is the courage to take an action and this act of leadership. So we've looked at the term, what is leadership? But what does it mean of being a technical leadership? Our last definition actually worked quite well. If we refine this idea of leadership, we're just putting a focus on technical. So it's the act of leading a group of people in a technical context. And this is indeed the world in which we all live in in software. Now, one big transition about what being a leader is, is thinking that it requires a shift. A shift is how you have to reward yourself differently. A shift is how you need to recognize progress in different ways. A shift is where you need to see value you add in, to the team and organization in a different perspective. And it's a shift in your mental model. It's also one of the hardest shifts to make because it's often about your identity. I know this. I've been on this journey too. And I've helped many other people in this journey. But from what is this shift from and from what is this shift to? For most of you, you start off being a developer in our world of software. And you may see yourself as a maker. 
And this is really about the features that you enable, the code that you produce, the refactoring and patterns that you manage to extract out of software, about taking something ambiguous like ideas, hypotheses, or stated requirements, and turning them into something a machine can actually run. This is the code that you make. It's the software and uh, systems that you make. To take success as a leader, you need to take a shift in rewarding yourself less as a person who makes this thing, but actually turning yourself into somebody who multiplies other makers. Multipliers make other makers more effective. And with an act of leadership, this is all you have to think about and take this mindset shift. Forget about the idea about being the 10-time developer. You can have 10 times more impact by helping multiply other developers by being more effective every day. And all it takes is a single act of leadership. So we've looked at the what. Let's talk about the where. Or where do people typically demonstrate technical leadership? Before we do that, let's take a little bit of a sidetrack. As Mary mentioned, I was sort of former CTO of N26. And I like to describe myself as the sort of shake-up CTO. So for those of you who worked in a startup, you know in early stage startup, you're doing discovery. You need to pivot really rapidly. You need to change uh, direction. You need to be really responsive. As you transition into a scale-up, as you found a business model, you need to change the culture, change the ways of working. The way of people talking with each other before doesn't really scale out when you have a team that's much, much larger, when you're distributed across multiple locations. And so you need to start to create some more structure, be a lot more explicit, and start to document some of these things, write down clear expectations, and make these things work. And this is some of the things that I was actually preparing for when I was actually a CTO. And it often means uh, putting these structures that are implicit into more explicit structures. One of the examples that we've been on a journey on is actually articulating a little bit more about career paths. Now, career paths are interesting because some of us, we need some clarity and shared expectations. For other of us, we don't necessarily want to be boxed into a title or a role. And so there's an art and a trick to every organization of having career paths that set common expectations without being too rigid and still being flexible and not being too complex. As Lara mentioned yesterday in her keynote, people need something to be able to understand how they're improving and seeing progress. They want something with equality and fairness so they can make sure that there isn't any biases into play. And something about predictability, about knowing where you could possibly be in several uh, years' time. And career paths can help with this. Now, when we often think about building a career path, one of the things that's often a common trait is thinking about different levels or depth of your career path. And this is really correlated to the type of impact you're expected to have in each of those levels. So the further you go down your career path in a particular direction, the more impact you should be having across uh, an organization uh, or your team. And so a common path is thinking about your development path, or perhaps you're being a junior software engineer to an engineer to being a senior, and maybe ending up as a tech lead. Now, a junior software engineer will often need a lot more help and assistance of breaking things down. Perhaps as they develop more experience, more confidence, they can take more complex problems, be more independent. As you become a senior, you start to perhaps coach and mentor other engineers and take on small systems of yourselves. And when you're a tech lead, you're starting to think about leading a whole team of technical engineers, building much more complex systems. Now, in the research for understanding how career paths are built in other organizations, one of the things you might hear about is often this thing called the two-track model of career development. And in the US, this is a very popular term, where people often talk about being an individual contributor on one side and making sure that there's a growth path for management on the other. Now, I've been thinking about the topic deeply for a long time because I've been very passionate about technical leadership. And I would actually posit that there are, there are three paths that most organizations should develop. And this is something that I call the trident model of career development. So one path where people are focused on your technical leadership, one path that is truly individual contributors, and one path that is more your classical management track. A good way about thinking about this is thinking about the 70 or 80% time, about where do you spend most of your time on what sort of activities. Now, individual com contributors will often be spending time contributing individually. Right? So writing code, debugging. It's never 100% of the time, 
because hopefully all of you are talking to users, showcasing your software, talking to other team members to share knowledge. Not even developers spend 100% of their time writing code. I often describe managers as responsible for managing the system in which people work, of making sure that everyone can work as effectively as what they can. Grace Hopper said, you lead people and you manage things, and this is what managers should be focusing on. Managing the system so that bright, smart, intelligent people who are willing to learn and solve problems can do the best that they can. When I think about technical leadership, this is where 70 to 80 percent of their time are people where they're leading and focusing on technical topics. They may not necessarily need or be responsible for the management of people or some structure, but they really focus on growing technical leadership skills across the organization and making sure that risks around technical topics, particularly across teams, may be something that needs to be uh, improved upon. And so when you think about a role like a tech lead, I would actually posit that this is something that sits classically in the technical leadership track. You may not necessarily be managing people, but you'll be leading people towards a te certain technical vision. Engineering managers are typically another type of role here, and then you may have specialists or a staff engineer on an individual contributor track. Now, what's interesting about this is that there is a sort of shared path before you start to diverge. And this is really quite key, because people who either manage or lead topics need to have the right context in which they're working to manage or lead appropriately. And so what this means is that people who are engineering managers or tech leads do need to have some experience in other roles of building software. They need to understand the nature of building software in our context. To demonstrate technical leadership, you don't need to be an expert in a particular technical area. You need to understand enough to be able to help facilitate the right conversations. The same way that managers need to understand the nature of building software is very different from the nature of managing a physical factory plant. And I've seen really effective leads from all different perspectives. Quality engineering backgrounds, project management backgrounds, product managers. You don't necessarily need to have to be a software engineer to be a great manager. You just need to have a good understanding about the nature of software. Now, another way of thinking about where people can demonstrate leadership is either thinking through formal or informal views. So the formal things are perhaps the things that your organization has on their own career paths. But the informal side is very interesting, because these are the things where if you don't have an official role, you don't have explicit permission, this gives you a lot of ability to practice your own acts of leadership. So these are the things that we often uh, um, sort of take inspiration from where somebody wants to solve a problem and they think they would like to help make that better. And that is an act of leadership. Now, what's interesting about the formal side is that we often talk about autonomy. And along with autonomy also comes responsibility and also accountability. And so that's an interesting consequence of people in formal roles, is that they need to make sure certain activities or responsibilities are fulfilled and they're accountable if they're not. Now, if you're a good leader or manager, you don't necessarily do them yourselves. You make sure you grow and build the team so that other people can have the opportunity to actually take action on this. This is good delegation, but they are accountable. Whereas in formal, you don't necessarily need to be accountable, and it's a good, safe way of practicing acts of leadership. Informal is a lot more flexible. Impact can also come in many shapes. So you can think about the breadth of having impact. Where you're an individual contributor, your impact is focused around you and the things that you produced. If you're a senior software engineer or you start coaching or mentoring somebody, your impact starts to affect one other person and enables what they can actually do. As you grow, you might start to have impact across a team or team of teams. And even if you're very successful, you might have an impact over the whole company or the industry. So, this is a good way of thinking about how you can also have acts that impact a broader set. And for us, yesterday we learned that we all want to have significance. This is a great way that you can personally feel significant by having an impact on many other people on a positive uh, manner. You can also think in terms of acts of leadership in terms of depth. So in complex organizations at scale, you need certain types of deep specialty and expertise to solve certain types of problems. Things aren't necessarily solved through a simple script, or you can't simply Google all sort of problems. There are certain types of problems in complex organizations where people might be able to dive very deeply, 
and try to come in and actually work out how to help that situation very rapidly. And there is also value to this of significant depth of impact as well. You do have to be careful, though, because I believe that you can't have too many of these in an organization because you can become a single point of failure or a risk to the company as well. So we've looked at the what, we've looked at the where. Let's now talk about the how. And let's look at about four specific flavors of technical leadership that I've seen. So the first one is really thinking about what do we actually do every day? How do we work? Now, software today is a lot more complex. If we think about your average mobile backend type of system, there are so many different areas, so many different tools, so many things that need to work together that you simply can't be an expert in all of them. And this is one of the reasons we work in teams. We have diverse skills, experience, problem-solving approaches. People who have academic backgrounds and understanding machine learning and how to apply the right algorithm. People with engineering who has a good idea about testability, deployment. People who have good experience with usability and making useful systems that end users love to use are super important to being successful. And so one of the interesting flavors that emerges out of this ecosystem are you have people who are interested in helping other people learn. So they're often passionate software developers or passionate people who understand that the nature of software is complex, that there are always more things to learn. And what they really care about is building the learning environment to allow other people to amplify their knowledge. And there are many ways that these people can actually take these acts of leadership. What they do is they look for where things aren't actually happening, and they fill a gap by creating a, a learning opportunity for people. And here are just a couple of examples that I've seen across many organizations and teams over time. Sometimes these people spread knowledge from team to team or within the team or across the organization. Sometimes they organize for external people to come in, so the organization gets exposed to new ideas and concepts and learns more about how the industry is evolving over time. And this act of leadership is really important because it is helping everyone improve at the same time. It has a big, big impact depending on how many people take part and how much they individually learn. Now, one question you may have is, well, what does that person get in result? And what's interesting about learning is that it isn't a zero-sum game. By helping other people learn, it's not like they're taking something from you. This is often an approach that a lot of people who start off pair programming have. I'm a senior engineer. I don't want to work with a junior engineer because I won't get as much stuff done. But actually, you often end up learning a lot more. You often end up learning things a lot more deeply when you start to articulate what you have. And there's an actual learning technique called the Feynman technique that has this. When you try to explain something to somebody else, and you find you can't quite articulate it in a very clear, concise manner that is easy to understand, perhaps you don't understand it as deeply as you thought you did. If you've ever had to try to explain things to a non-technical person about a technical concept, you'll find out where your boundaries are quickly and where you don't actually have the understanding you thought you did. This is captured very well by this quote, which I'll leave you to read. Now, a person who I admire on Twitter is uh, Ruth Marlin, and she's a wonderful person who's helping people understand the nature of software architecture and the role of the software architect in today's world. And she is a really great example of taking acts of leadership, of helping people grow and learn and understand this. And this flavor is what I call the knowledge cultivator. So let's look at another type of flavor. Well, in software, we're constantly learning, as we've found out. We learn about the problem domain because we're not often building the same system again and again. And often, we're coming up with new solutions. And part of this is because the ecosystem has changed. We're often dealing with new tools and new platforms of trying to solve these in interesting ways. Now, an interesting consequence of learning is the side effect of making mistakes. This is why that none of us ever work on perfect systems. Right? There is no perfect system out there because we're all constantly learning, and we don't get a chance to rewrite that system the second time in that perfect manner. And this is why techniques like refactoring uh, and re-architecting are super key at dealing with technical debt and making sure we improve that system. Now, a consequence of lots of areas for improvement or mistakes uh, is that there are often things that teams feel 
there are often pain points that teams have. And somebody on the team might start to notice, oh, this is a common thing that everyone's talking about. They go to another team and they find out that team is also having that pain point. And in many organizations, teams don't often get the time to address some of those pain points because they're not painful enough. Now, this act of leadership is often about listening to these pain points from different perspectives and then deciding to actually do something about that. And this flavor of leadership draws upon powerful questions. So what do powerful questions look like? There are open-ended questions that question assumptions that assume that there is no right solution. So what's troubling you about X? What do you think about Y? Or how would you solve this issue if you, were in, if you had the time and opportunity to deal with it? Powerful questions are use open-ended like how and what. They avoid the binary uh, sort of standard question of do you think we should do X? Which is a trap that we all fall into when we're thinking about solutions. However, even when a team or a group of people decide there is a way to improve a situation, it's often not enough. And this is where this active leadership needs to go further as well. They need to get buy-in for the solution and often convince other people that it's worth investing in time. They often need to build a community and a gathering around this. They need to influence people to get buy-in that this is the right thing to do and something that's worth solving. They bridge connections between people to make sure that everyone who wants to contribute to a solution can make the best solution available and that people have the time to actually do this as well. And this flavor of leadership is called the advocate. We need to advocate for a certain solution and create that beacon of light that we want to improve a certain type of situation. Now, people who take on this flavor of leadership uh, are often people who have a lot of patience. So they often have a relentless focus on improving some aspect to software because it takes time. Grace Hopper took two years to build that compiler, even all the critics saying that it wouldn't be possible to do. Now, I started software in the early 2000s, and a really good example of this is continuous integration. So back then, if you were building software like myself, you used to actually have a release team. right? So you used to have a group of people who would build and assemble the software that you might think about releasing, only to have to go through testing phases and code fixes to make things work. And there was one engineer, Matt Femmel in ThoughtWorks, who decided, this is completely automatable. Let's write a shell script to replace the build team. We can automate this. And so they sat down, they built a prototype, and then started actually building the first continuous integration server that was later open sourced as Cruise Control. Funnily enough, I Googled it, and the project is still out there today. And it's given birth to all of the continuous integration industry and the continuous delivery movement as well as part of that. But this is a really good example of the advocate in action. They take a problem, and they want to improve this at play. What about another pattern of leadership? Well, you might think about organizations as hierarchies. I actually prefer to think of them as networks. So you often have your default team network. But actually, people are involved in many other types of networks as well. iOS, they might be domain-driven design or interest groups. You might actually be about interests that you play outside of work that connect people, um, or perhaps a certain type of topic. But one interesting thing is that we all belong to different types of networks. We belong to multiple identities. And so you can actually use this act of leadership to help amplify other people. You can choose to take your network, you can sponsor somebody, and you can actually invest your social capital to give other people benefit from the networks that you have. And you can lend your privilege. And there's been a wonderful talk about lending your privilege at Lead Dev before. What does this sound like? Well, it's as easy as, let me introduce you to Reese. Or I can ask Jordan for that. Let's ask for a favor. Perhaps it's about, I'm not so sure, but I know somebody like Blair who will. If you want to do and develop this, you need to think about perhaps your reputation score. And you can think about this in terms of your experience, knowledge, and being likable. And this pattern is called the connector. The final pattern, which I don't need to explain too much, is we saw a wonderful example of that yesterday with Nicholas Means, the storyteller. I like to also call them the shaman, the people who can inspire and describe the history behind something, who can create that vision and the story of where people can actually go towards. So what can we learn from these patterns and flavors? 
Well, we've looked at different types of leadership about the what, the where, and the how. And what we've learned is that there are many flavors of technical leadership. You're only really limited by yourself, and all it really takes is the act of taking ownership of something. It's about creating something out of nothing. It's about multiplying others and creating an environment for other people to thrive. And so my final words of advice for you is recognizing that remember that everyone has their own style, and you need to invest in finding your own flavor. Most importantly, don't forget to have fun and enjoy yourself along the way. Thank you.